In this lesson, we're going to take a look at a method for finding limits called using something called the squeeze theorem. There's not much to do here other than to state the squeeze theorem and then to illustrate its use with a few examples. So the way to think about the squeeze theorem is that it's an additional tool for finding limits analytically. And we can sometimes use it in cases where substitution and simplification are two main methods for finding limits analytically won't work. It tends to be especially useful when the limit you're trying to find is for a function involving either sine or cosine. We'll start by taking a look at kind of a graphical illustration of what the squeeze theorem says. So let's say we've got three functions, call them f, g, and h, and take a look at this graph that shows all three. So on the top there in pink, you have the graph of h. On the bottom, also in pink, you have the graph of g. And in the middle, in between them in blue, you have the graph of f. Now, the first thing to note here is that the graph of f is always between the graphs of g and h. So it never goes above or below either one of those. And notice we've got the point where x is equal to c labeled on the x-axis. And notice that as the graphs of g and h get closer and closer to where x equals c, they kind of come together at the same point where y equals l. So you can see that they're um, getting closer and closer to each other. And because the graph of f is always in between the graphs of g and h, it's forced to get closer and closer to l as well as x approaches c. As long as it's required to stay between the graphs of g and h, it is squeezed in between them and like I said, forced to get closer and closer to L. So that idea is what's behind the squeeze theorem and the name kind of gives away what's going on here. We saw that squeezing happen in the graph. So let's say we've got the kind of setup we just saw. We've got three functions, f, g, and h, with this relationship for all values of x. f of x is between g of x and h of x. Let's further assume that the limit as x approaches c of g of x is equal to the limit as x approaches c of h of x. Call that limit L, just like we saw in our graph. What we can conclude from this is that the limit as x approaches c of f of x will also be equal to L. And c here can be any number. It can also be infinite. And we can do this with one-sided limits as well. So pretty much any type of limit we've encountered up to this point will work in the context of the squeeze theorem if the functions involved have this relationship. So let's look at some examples of how to apply the squeeze theorem to find limits. The first one we'll find, the first limit we'll find is this one. The limit as x approaches zero of x squared times the sine of one over x. Notice here that substitution won't work. If we try substitution, we're going to get zero in that denominator inside the sine function. We get an undefined expression that doesn't work. We can also can't really simplify. What do you do with the sine of one over x in a way that would allow you to simplify it to find this limit? There's not much you can do. Here's a graph, and you can see from the graph that it sort of looks like this limit is equal to zero. Right. Notice that as we're getting closer and closer to where x equals zero, the graph seems to be sort of bouncing up and down, but less and less and getting closer and closer to where y equals zero. The squeeze theorem will allow us to prove analytically that this limit really is equal to zero. So here's how we'll do this. The first thing we're going to recall here is that the sine function's values are always between negative one and one. So whatever theta is, the sine of theta is between negative one and one. And so that's gonna apply even if what's inside the sine function is one over X. So we know that one over X, the sine of one over X rather, is always between negative one and one. Now let's take that compound inequality and multiply everything in it by X squared. 
I mentioned here that x squared is always non-negative. That's relevant because we don't need to worry then about switching the direction of our inequality signs, which we would have to do if we're multiplying by a negative number. So if we multiply everything by one over by sorry by x squared here, we get this compound inequality, where x squared times the sine of one over x is always between negative x squared and positive x squared. Here's a graph kind of showing what this tells us. So in red there, you've got the graph of y equals x squared. In blue, you've got the graph of y equals negative x squared. And in black in the middle, you've got the graph of y equals x squared times the sine of one over x. And notice that that black graph is always in between the two parabolas, the red one and the blue one. And notice further, that it is, so to speak, getting squeezed in between them as each of those parabolas gets closer and closer to the point zero, zero. So the, what, what we can observe here then is that the limit as x approaches zero of negative x squared and the limit as x approaches zero of positive x squared are both zero. You can see that from the graph. You could also find those by substitution. And notice that negative x squared and positive x squared are the functions on the outside of our compound inequality. Since x squared times the sine of one over x is in between those for all values of x, it gets squeezed towards zero as well. In other words, the limit as x approaches zero of that function in the middle, the one we were interested in, is zero. The squeeze theorem guarantees it. So that's the idea behind the squeeze theorem. Here's a second example, this time involving a one-sided limit. We're gonna find the limit as X approaches zero from the left of X cubed times the cosine of two over X. We'll get started on this in a way we did very similar, in a way very similar to what we did in our last example. We'll start with just the cosine part of our function. We know that the cosine function is always between negative one and one. So the cosine of two over X is always between negative one and one. Now let's multiply everything by X cubed. Here we need to be a little careful. We're letting X approach zero from the left. In other words, our X values here are always to the left of zero on our number line. So they're always negative. That means that X cubed here is always going to be negative. So when we multiply everything by X cubed, we need to make sure to switch the signs, switch to the directions rather of our inequality signs. So we know that negative X cubed is always greater than or equal to X cubed times the cosine of two over X and positive X cubed is always less than or equal to that. Let's take the limit of all of those as X approaches zero from the left. Now we know what the limits on the left side and the right side here are. Those are both equal to zero. Again, we can find them by substitution. And so by the squeeze theorem, since that function in the middle is always in between the negative X cubed and positive X cubed, and both of those approach zero, the limit as X approaches zero from the left here of X cubed times the cosine of two over X is also equal to zero. Very similar to our first example, this time it involved a one-sided limit and that involved a little bit of sign switching with the inequalities. But other than that, this worked just like our first example. And again, what justifies this is the squeeze theorem and the fact that the limits on the outside of that inequality are both zero. Here's a little graphical interpretation of what we just found. So the red graph here is the graph of y equals negative x cubed. The blue graph is the graph of y equals positive x cubed. And in black in the middle, we have the graph of y equals x cubed times the cosine of two over x. And you can see it too is getting squeezed closer and closer to zero, zero as x gets closer to zero. Let's take one, a look at one more example, this time involving an infinite limit. We'll look at the limit as x approaches infinity of the sine of x over x. So let's start with what we know about the sine function and its range. One thing to note here 
is that because we're letting x approach positive infinity, we can work under the assumption that x is always positive because we're going to let x get bigger and bigger and bigger in the positive direction. So the only values of x we really care about are positive ones. So we know that the sine of x is always between negative 1 and 1. We can divide everything there by x. Again, we're keeping in mind that for our purposes, in this case, x is always positive. So dividing by x does not require any sign switching. Now, the limit as x approaches infinity of negative 1 over x is 0. As x gets bigger and bigger, negative 1 over x is going to get closer and closer to 0. And the limit as x approaches infinity of 1 over x, the function on the right side of our inequality, is also equal to 0. So because both of those are equal to 0, the squeeze theorem guarantees that the limit as x approaches infinity of the sine of x over x will also be equal to 0. <clears throat> 